to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, to the only God, be glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going to come back to that doxology from one of the texts we're going to look at in our lesson today, but I want to mention something I already did in class. It's so wonderful to see the, the, the numbers picking up with more and more who feel comfortable with being in the assembly again. It's a beautiful sight. And as I mentioned at the Bible class hour, this is another historic day in the history of the League City Congregation. I mean, we had this unprecedented crisis that's still unfolding, really, in certain ways with this pandemic. And so we didn't see each other in person for, for quite a while. And we suspended the, the Bible classes we normally have. And so today, as you know, was that first day when we resumed classes here. Now, not exactly like we had them before, but essentially we've resumed the Bible class program. And I say that's historic because uh, we've never had a situation in my lifetime in the church where, where we had to study in different ways like we've been doing through um, uh, distance learning. That's how I worked on my degree, so I'm thinking of that term, but uh, using the live streaming or the archive studies that are uploaded to YouTube and available on Facebook and all of that. But in-person classes, as much as we appreciate those resources and are going to continue to use them and want them to bless those who can't be with us and those at other times and places may be able to join us, we want to encourage you to participate. If you feel comfortable in doing so, if you're able to do so, participate in these classes. This is tremendously important. I think the real deep transformative work of God on our hearts takes place when we're engaged with God in the text of His Word. And when little hearts and minds are being shaped in those classes, and when we're taking that time to be together and to hear God speak to us, and even though it's not exactly uh, ideal with uh, wearing the masks and spread out and all of that, still what we're doing in our classes is tremendously important. This is a good time to remind ourselves of that, of the value, of the importance of that great work. Please don't neglect that. I want to thank our teachers. Thank you for those who've taught in the past. Thank you for those who are teaching now. Please consider teaching in the future. There's going to be a need, always a need, for those who will, will step up and take part in this life-changing work that impacts the church for time and eternity. I just really want to thank God and to praise our God for the privilege of being able to come together in class, to focus our attention on what He's revealed to us, to reflect on it, and to allow Him to work in us and uh, to let His Word have free course in our souls. We need to be doing that every day, spending time in the Word of God, as Richard said in the prayer earlier, and meditating on the Word of God. But, uh, but our classes are a special aid, uh, a special, it's a, really a gift of our Lord to help facilitate our understanding of who He is and His work in our lives. Well, this morning I want you to think about what I believe is one of the most important things that has ever happened in the history of mankind. I mean, we could mark, of course, the, the birth of Christ and the death of our Lord and His resurrection and His ascension. Those certainly would be historical moments that rank as, as the most important but after that, I don't know of anything more significant, more important in shaping the course of history, more powerful in God fulfilling His purpose in this world than something that took place about 2,000 years ago in Syria. Just north of Palestine there, you see above Israel, you have Syria and you have the city of Damascus. And what I'm referring to took place 
on a road leading to Damascus and then was consummated and ultimately fully realized in that city of Damascus. Now you surely are aware, I hope, that there is a terrible civil war taking place in Syria. The conditions there are horrible for so many people, but especially for those who identify as Christian. And you have some very um, ancient Christian communities well established back for centuries there. We think of going all the way back to this time of the early Christians who were in this part of the world and how that tradition uh, has continued in one form or another even to the present day. But c conditions are severe there for so many and this map shows some of the factions with Assad, the dictator, and what he controls and the others as well. But what I'm talking about, as I said, took place on the road to Damascus. I'm referring to the appearance of Jesus to Saul of Tarsus and then ultimately the conversion of Saul to become not just a Christian but an apostle and not just an apostle but the chief apostle as he referred to himself, chief among the apostles and the great evangelist taking the gospel to the Gentile world. Now, as you know, I like to show some of these classic renditions of these Bible scenes, and it's interesting to me that uh, I think this is Valentin. I had a picture from Valentin or Caravaggio, uh, this might be, but I had an image like this in Bible class of the Apostle Paul. But when you, when you look for images and you look back in history and you see the way the conversion of Saul, as it's called, or Paul's conversion is depicted, it always shows a horse. There's always a horse, and Paul is falling off of a horse. And if you read the account three, in three places in Scripture, do you know where the three places are where this is recounted? Obviously, it's something of tremendous importance to have that much space devoted to it by Luke in the book of Acts. And it's in Acts chapter 9, and then again in Acts 22, and in Acts 26 where Paul relates it then later, and then ultimately uh, to Agrippa, first in Jerusalem, then ultimately to Agrippa. But you see him often depicted as falling down to the ground from a horse, and uh, uh, it's a little bit difficult to see, but if you look carefully, you can see here he's falling off of the horse, the bright light that, that he saw. We'll look at this text in, in just a moment. And here again, this is Caravaggio in one of his famous works and there he is and and of course these these characters are often depicted in 16th and 17th western european type clothing that wouldn't be accurate to the original scene at all my point is my point is that some of the great works of art and history were inspired by these events in scripture of tremendous importance including what happened when Jesus appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus? It's had that kind of impact on great artists and great thinkers in the history of the world. So let's look at that this morning for a few minutes as we continue our series, The Face-to-Face -face with Jesus. And this is our seventh lesson in the series. We're going to call this Persecutor to Proclaimer because that's exactly what we find happening with Saul. He begins, we're introduced to him in Scripture, as a persecutor of the church, and ultimately he becomes the great proclaimer of the gospel who gives his life to carry the gospel to the world. Let's think about this. There's just a few basic points that I want to make. Four, really the first two are closely related, so you might think of them as three. Let's call it four points. And first of all, we see from this face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus the power of the gospel. And let's, let's develop this now for a moment. When we're first introduced to this man Saul in Scripture, it's in connection with the first martyr of the church. The, the first person to be murdered for faith in Christ was Stephen, right? And in Acts chapter 7, the mob, the, the, the Jewish mob, was raging and fell upon him and dragged him out and stoned him to death. And when they did so, 
Acts 7 and verse 58 says, they cast them out of the city and stoned them, and the witnesses, the ones who would be the, the first to throw the stones, laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. It's just incredible that that's the first reference we have to the great and beloved apostle whom God used to write uh, over a third, about a third of, of the New Testament documents. I mean, how often do we say, Paul said, and here uh, Paul wrote this, and we refer to, to, to Paul, and yet the first time, that's what we see. And in Acts 8, 1 through 3, we're told Saul approved of his execution. He was a prominent rabbi. Think of uh, one of the elite intellectuals of the Jewish community. He was trained by a prominent rabbi, and so he would be someone with, uh, we would think of with mu maybe multiple PhDs. He's a brilliant mind, and he was a figure of considerable influence, and so he was giving his approval to what was happening there. And then the text says, there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men buried Stephen, and they made great lamentation over him. But then look at this, verse 3. Acts 8, 3, Saul was ravaging the church, entering into house after house. Imagine if you went home today, and someone broke down your door and dragged you off to prison to await trial to be executed because you professed that Jesus is the Messiah. I mean, that's what he was doing. Door to door, so that he can lead people out to be prosecuted for the crime of being a Christian. So he dragged off, the text says, men and women, and he committed them to prison. So we learn that he even goes so far as to get permission to go persecute Christians outside of Israel to go to Syria. And so we get to Acts chapter 9, 1 through 4. Saul was still breathing threats and murder. The ASV says slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. Went to the high priest, asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So it, it's not just that Paul wants to prevent it from the, this belief in Christ as the Messiah from uh, taking hold in Jerusalem. He, he's going out now and he's pursuing these Christians so that if he found any, Luke says, belonging to the way. So apparently that's how the church early on referred to herself. The Christians called themselves the way, which is very significant because Christ said, I am the way. And so the church is the way of Christ. Well, uh, or the text says again, men or women, that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So this is a horrible thing. And, and now as he went on his way, this is, this is it. He approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him and falling to the ground. Now, it does say he fell to the ground. And I think that's why people want to depict it more dramatically. And so there arose in the popular imagination this idea that he's on a horse and he fell off the horse to the ground, which is, of course, very dangerous. But he fell to the ground. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, and when he recounts it later, he says in Hebrew, he heard a voice say to him in Hebrew, Saul, Saul, that double address that makes the, the, that makes the address so personal. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So he sees this light that blinds him, we learn later, so bright. And he hears this voice. And he said, well, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am, imagine the shock as his whole worldview and everything he had been devoting himself to suddenly came crashing down with those words, I am Jesus. He really is alive. He really has been raised to the de from the dead. And he's talking to me. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. And notice he was... We're told he was ravaging the church. He was persecuting the church. Yet Jesus said, you're, you're persecuting me. In other words, the church is the body of Christ. And so when we harm the church, Christ takes that personally as harming him personally. 
And we need, to think, we need to think very seriously about that. We don't have time to pursue that thought. Later, when he recounts it to King Agrippa, in Acts 26, 13 through 14, he says, At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone round about me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, now imagine this, everyone falls back. This is the presence of God. This is a theophany. It's a Christophany. It's the appearance of deity. They fall to the ground. And he said, I heard a voice saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, the Lord says something rather insulting to him. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. The goads, when you have an ox and he's pulling a cart, a lot of times they didn't, the ox were stubborn and didn't want to oxen were stubborn, didn't want to pull the cart, they'd kick at the cart. They could kick back at the cart and destroy, break up your cart. could be a very expensive proposition to have to deal with, or a situation rather. And so you put these goads, these uh, pointed spikes on the end of it, so when they kick back, they get pricked, and they get cut, and they realize, no, I'm not going to do that. But sometimes they'll kick against it anyway and, and Paul, that's what Paul was doing by resisting Christ by resisting the true will of God he was hurting himself it was like kicking against the goat see when we when we don't submit to the way of God we're we're just hurting ourselves I know a lot of people don't want to obey the gospel or live the Christian life because they think it's in their best interest to, to, to just do what they whatever they please but really when we live contrary to the will of God we're hurting ourselves but God can save us from ourselves just like he did with Saul what what brought about this great reversal in his life then? See, we have to account for that. How does he go from the persecutor of the church to the proclaimer of the gospel? How does he go to someone murdering Christians to, to someone who is willing to be beaten, who is beaten again and again and again for proclaiming Christ, who was imprisoned and ultimately martyred, who suffered more than we could imagine? When Jesus appeared to him, he said, Saul, when he, when he recounts it in Acts 22, he tells him uh, that the Lord said to him, I'm going to show you how many things you must suffer for my name. How do you account for that? I mean, that, that historical situation, the, not just the change in course of this man, Saul of Tarsus, but the complete reversal in his life, that speaks to the power of the gospel. When you know and truly believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He has been raised from the dead, that He does live, it will not only affect your life, it will completely transform your life. It won't just change you, it will completely reverse your condition for time and for all eternity. And that speaks not just to the power of the gospel, but the truthfulness of the gospel, the, levid, the validity, rather, the validity of the claims of Christianity, of who Jesus is, and that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And we know that he's been raised from the dead because he's been seen. And there are witnesses to his resurrection. And we have their credible testimony, and among them is Saul. When I, when I look at his account, sometimes I wonder... Why doesn't God do for everyone what he did for Saul? Thought, why doesn't he appear to every person personally so that they can see Jesus with their own eyes and believe? Certainly he could if he wanted to. Wouldn't you like to have a vision of Christ? Wouldn't you like to be able to tell someone, well, Christ will appear to you and then you'll know, then you'll see well, that's not God's will to operate in that way. His will is for us to come to faith, and he's provided the evidence we need for that faith, right? So th the signs that Jesus did, John says in John 20, 30, and 31, they've been written so that we might believe. And simply seeing Christ is no proof that people would submit to him. John 12, 37 says, though he had done so many signs before them, yet they did not believe on him. 
So it, not, it doesn't mean necessarily that would convince all men. And so there's something we call, there's a doctrine we can explore another time in another situation, maybe in class, but there's something called the hiddenness of God, where he's both revealed himself to those who will really seek to know him and be honest with the evidence, and yet he's also hidden so that those who choose to reject him will be blinded or he'll be veiled from them in a sense the hiddenness of God. So the Lord doesn't do this for everyone, but he did it for Saul. And in fact, this was his destiny from birth. He says in Galatians when he recalls this, that God called him from his mother's womb. This was God's purpose when, from the time, from eternity. And from the time Paul was Paul in his mother's womb. That was God's plan. And so he was going on a much different course than what God had ordained for him. But this encounter changed his life. Now, you and I, are, I, I don't see any evidence that you, or I, you and I will have a visitation of Christ, a vision like this. But the account we have of, of the reversal of Paul and the change in the disciples who went from fearful and, and afraid and hiding and confused w with no basis in their cultural situation for believing in the Messiah would suffer and die again to in a matter of days boldly proclaiming the resurrection of Christ. See, that, that change in the disciples and that change in the life of Paul is evidence of the power and the truth of what you and I believe. And it was brought about by that face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. Now, just two, two other points briefly. It also shows us, of course, the depth of God's mercy. Paul was a murderer. And yet, he was still not beyond the reach of God's grace. And so later, Paul reflected on why the Lord was merciful to him. And it was in order to say something to you and me. So when he recounts it later in 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 through 17, he, he says to Timothy, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I, I acted ignorantly and in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy. Apparently this was a saying. This was something that the church, you know, like we, we have a saying, speak where the Bible speaks, be silent where the Bible is silent. We used to hear that a lot in churches of Christ. We have sayings. We have uh, idiomatic expressions. We have a pro proverbial uh, statements that we hear and repeat. Well, this w there were sayings like that in the early church that the Christians were known for affirming. And this is one of them. And Paul said, this is a good one. It's true. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am. I know you're expecting the word chief there. That's the, what I always heard it in preaching and in the ASV until I switched to the ESV. Uh, of whom I am the foremost. He said, but I receive mercy for this reason. That in me, as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. In other words, Paul is saying, the Lord wanted to show if he could save me, he could save you. And sometimes we encounter people who have such a burden of guilt, who believe they've messed up their lives so badly, that they've done terrible things, and that God could never save them, that they could never be forgiven. And all we have to do is point them to Saul. If God could save Saul, he could save anyone. That's what Paul was saying. He made me an example of the overflowing of his grace. You're not beyond the reach of God's grace. And so it shows the depth of his mercy. But what I like, here's the benediction, here's the doxology I used at the start. It causes him to burst into praise. To the king of the ages, immortal. This is what this is, an expression of praise. Immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So in other words, when you think about the depth of God's grace, when you contemplate the magnitude of his mercy, it should cause you to fall down and worship. It should cause you to cry out 
and say, to him be glory and honor forever and ever. It should compel us to worship. We should want to be here, and I'm talking about worship in our personal lives every day, but our assembled worship as well, because we want to give praise to God for the wonder of his grace and his mercy. We could say more about that, but finally, let's point this out, and this will segue well into the invitation. But, and I know that this is a mouthful, isn't it? The insufficiency of sincerity. Wow, it's not, not exactly pithy, is it? But put it down. I forget, did, I, did, I forget, did I forget to tell everyone to write at the top of the page from persecutor to proclaimer? I just, I'm alarmed there that I, I might have skipped that. And it would be the first time that I made an error. And, but notice this, the insufficiency of sincerity. This is an important lesson from Paul's encounter with Jesus that led to his conversion. Well, what do I mean by this? Well, m most people think that it, it really doesn't matter what you believe. As long as you're sincere in your belief and you're a good person, you're a nice person, or you believe Jesus is Lord, that really that's all that matters. And whether or not our beliefs contradict, you know, if we have contradicting beliefs, they, they all can't be true. Now, I know a lot of people redefine truth that whatever, is tr tr whatever you believe is true for you. And then you have your truth, and I have my truth, and all that is, of course, nonsense. And we don't believe that in other areas, and yet somehow in religion or in morality, that idea uh, is accepted. But people think, well, as long as you're devout, as long as you're sincere, as long as you're part of some church or some faith, or, you know, you're active in your beliefs, you know, you're devoted, that's all that matters. Well, look at Saul. He was devout. He was doing what he did in persecuting the church because he thought he was serving God. And yet he was lost. In fact, in one of his defenses in Jerusalem before the Jewish council, in, in, in Acts 23, 1, Paul said, he looked at the council and he said, Brothers, I've lived before God in all good conscience to this day. Even when he was persecuting Christians, Paul said, I had a good conscience. He was doing it with a clear conscience. People think, well, as long as I have a clear conscience, as long as I believe what I'm doing is right, I mean, then that's all that really matters. Now, Paul, Paul thought what he was doing was right when he was persecuting God's people. And I like what he said to Agrippa, Acts 26, 9. He, as he looked back, he said, I, I, I myself, he said, I was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He he thought in persecuting the church, it's what God wanted him to do. He was wrong. And he was under the condemnation of God for that. He was sincere. He was zealous. You know, uh, he ta Paul talked about later some, his own Jewish brethren who were like him, who were rejecting Christ. And he said my, in Romans 10, 1 and 2, my heart's desire and prayer to them is that they may be saved. Well, well why aren't they saved, Paul? Why you're concerned? He said, I bear them witness. They have a zeal for God. They're zealous for God. And this is the one true God. They're, they even hold, they've got that much right. And we're the covenant people of God under the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament dispensation. He said they've got a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. So they were lost. It's not enough just to be zealous and it's not enough just to have a clear conscience and, and think we're right. Paul was killing Christians. It's like what Jesus said in John 16 too when he talked about the, the, how the apostles would face persecution. He said, they're going to put you out of the synagogues and the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. Yes, we can become that confused and distorted in our thinking that when we murder people, we think we're doing God a favor. That's what Paul was doing. So he is really perhaps the, the ultimate example. Or think of the crucifixion. Those who believe that they're doing the will of God and who are sincere and who are devout and who are zealous and yet we can still be lost. John eight thirty one and 32. It's the truth that will set us free. That's why we have to exam be willing to critically examine our beliefs. Because no doubt there, there will be many, many people 
in hell for all of eternity who died thinking they were devout, faithful, diligent servants of God. I have to be willing to examine. I can read my Bible every day and pray for hours on end and be active in, in all the works of the church. Be zealous for God and yet still be lost. We have to make sure. We have to be willing to examine our beliefs and be corrected by the Word of God. Now, Saul was willing to do that when he was confronted with the evidence in the way that he was. He allowed it to change his beliefs and his life. And that's what we have to do when, when the gospel confronts where we are and what we, what, what we think about ourselves and our relationship to God. You know, a lot of people think Saul was saved on the road to Damascus when Jesus ap appeared to him, but he wasn't. He went into the city. He had seen the Lord. He had believed in him. He was praying and fasting for several days before Ananias came to him and told him what he needed to then do, Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. Since he believed, since he was penitent, he was brokenhearted. He, it, 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 he had changed his whole perspective. That's, that's repentance. And yet, he still hadn't had his sins taken away because Ananias came to him. The Lord sent Ananias to him. And when, when the Lord first came to Ananias and said, I want you to go to Saul, he's like, wait, who? You want, you want me to go to Saul, the one who's killing all the Christians? No, he sent a man with the saving message to him. And when he got there, he said, now, why are you waiting? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. If he had been saved on the road to Damascus, as so many people think, then how could it be several days later he still had to have his sins washed away? When are our sins washed away? When we're biblically baptized for the remission of our sins, Acts 2.38. That's when the blood of Christ will wash away our sins. There's a lot to think about when we look at the encounter that Paul had with Jesus. But that, that I say face to face. He saw the bright light and he encountered Jesus because he would become an eyewitness to the resurrection. That was a qualification of his apostleship that he had actually seen the resurrected Lord so that we could have his testimony and we could know that Jesus has, has been raised. But it changed his life and, it, and through Paul, what Paul preached, through Paul's labors, through his, his writings as he was guided by the Holy Spirit to write a, th a whole third of the New Testament, the Lord changed the course of history Will it change your life? Will it change your eternity? Let's think on these things. We pray for God's will to be done in your life. Let's sing this song together. Let's stand while we...